Hi, my name is Lizzie Chan, and I'm a member of the CPI Institute's Young Leaders and Alternative Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. I am delighted to host today's episode of the CPR YADR Corporate Council interview series. The YADR seeks to educate the next generation of leaders in the ADR field on the full spectrum of dispute prevention and resolution techniques, and to provide an insider's perspective on how CPR's community of in-house counsel, external counsel, and other experts in the field are using dispute prevention and resolution techniques to manage conflict to enable purpose. And as part of this goal, I am hosting this interview series where I'm asking questions of in-house counsel from companies all around the world about their experiences with ADR and their career advice for young practitioners. Today, I am delighted to welcome Anna Rothke, who is Senior Legal Counsel at Chevron based in California. Hi, Aaron. We're so happy to have you here today. Hi, Lizzie. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. So my first question for you is, can you tell us a bit about your career experience, your role at Chevron, and the types of disputes that you manage? Sure. Uh, so my, my career path to Chevron was, I suppose, a little unique in that I, I, I worked at a large international law firm in San Francisco for a number of years, um, but really didn't do a whole lot of energy-based work uh, before I came to Chevron. Um, but I did manage a lot of international uh, cases, um, including investigations. And um, what, what brought me to Chevron was the international scope of our business. Um, and that kind of falls right within what I currently do. I'm a, a member of the litigation management team, uh, the upstream litigation management team. And what that means is I manage um, internally and externally a number of disputes all around the world for our various business units. And those can be anything from a, a very simple contract matter, can be anything, can be a personal injury matter, or could be you know, one of the you know, more significant arbitration matters or mediation matters that you might traditionally see in an international litigation and arbitration. Um, most of my work is, is outside of North America. Uh, so basically what that means is I'm um, working, traveling a lot and on the phone at all hours of the day as um, I know how, how I know you know how that is, um, but uh, but I would say that the, the the great and interesting thing about my work is is my is that my cases cover such a wide gamut. Uh, it, the large international arbitrations, of course, take up a significant amount of time, uh, but the diversity in my my docket is what keeps the uh, keeps the work interesting. It sounds like you're involved in a number of you know, different types of matters. I'm covering a whole range of ADI. And that you also, and I imagine that you also um, sometimes hire external counsel to assist you um, in advocating for Chevron in these disputes. So I was wondering if you can tell us about how you select external counsel to represent Chevron in any given dispute. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of, uh, you know, we, we, there's a number of counsel, trusted counsel that uh, I will say we probably go back to frequently. But I, we also make a point about trying to identify cases that are appropriate for uh, counsel that we haven't worked for before, um, because we like to, to see what's out there and, you know, getting diversity of, of thoughts across different, um, different law firms, I think, is something that is uh, um, very important. And another thing we look for um, is, is diversity amongst the the legal teams that law firms put forward. I mean, I know a lot of um, different clients and different law firms talk about the importance of diversity uh, with their external counsel, but I can tell you that Chevron, is, that's something that we take very um, seriously. Um, it is an expectation that the, the case teams that work for us um, from external counsel uh, put forward diverse teams um, so that uh, we can get and, and, and I will say that the, the reason we do that, the reason I do that personally when I um, am, am recruiting and hiring different legal teams is a couple of reasons. First, I think diversity in and of itself is, is a great goal um, to, uh, for a number of reasons. But secondly, I think you just get better results when you have a diverse members of a legal team, you get different perspectives on different backgrounds, different thoughts, and, uh, and that always leads to uh, 
to, to better outcomes in my view. It's fantastic that at Chevron, you really champion diversity in all of its forms. So I, I was mentioning to you earlier that an ECA task force report on gender diversity issued last year actually identified users of arbitration, including companies as being champions for diversity by having certain expectations of external counsel um, yep. and, and presenting diverse teams. Uh, one thing that we've all lived through uh, since I think early, uh, early last year is the COVID-19 pandemic. How has the pandemic affected the way that Chevron manages its disputes risks? Well, one way uh, it's, it's uh, changed how we do things is that I'm sitting here at my kitchen table during this call and doing this interview instead of in the office. <laughs> That's one major reason how, uh, how it's changed. Um, I, uh, but but I, I, I will say that um, one of the great things and really the, the unexpected things that COVID-19 has, has made us all realize is it hasn't had to change how we manage our cases um, that much. Chevron is a very safety oriented company. So, you know, we, our offices, many of our offices around the world, including headquarters have been um, largely closed for a number of months. Gosh, I have, I personally haven't been, I've been working from home since March, 2020. Um, but I will say with the tools that we have and the relationships that, that I personally have with folks around the world, it's actually been is much more seamless than I ever would have expected. Uh, being able to work from home and, and work externally. And part of that might be because in my role, I travel so much and I'm used to working remotely from hotels or from, from other office buildings. But uh, I will say that the, one of the, the, the great things about um, at least this company is that it's, um, we've been able to manage the COVID-19 situation and work uh, fairly seamlessly through it. It's great that Chevron has had the agility to respond so well to the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, something that has gone virtual also uh, proceedings, legal proceedings. Uh, what's been your experience with virtual proceedings um, recently? So I've done a, I've actually been involved in a number of, of hearings uh, and ADR related uh, proceedings over the course of the pandemic, uh, mediations, um, a number of, of arbitration hearings. Some of them have actually been uh, relatively lengthy, a couple weeks long. Um, and if you would have asked me in early 2020, if we could have done a, 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 a video hearing of, of that kind of complexity with witnesses and cross-examination, I would have thought you were crazy. <laughs> but um, it's actually worked out much better than I would have thought. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it if the landscape of mediation and arbitration changed, at least on the fringes, to have these types of virtual hearings going forward, because they do work, um, you know, again, much better than I would have expected. I tend to be a little old fashioned in my thinking. Um, I, I, I prefer the in-person hearing, the in-person examinations, whether direct or cross examinations. So I, I, I still think those um, will, will govern the day. But uh, I've had a very good success with with virtual hearings. Um, you know, again, much more than I would have expected. I'm really glad to hear that you've had such a good experience with virtual proceedings because it sounds like they're here to stay, and that in many types of cases they might might really drive down costs as well. Uh, for example, when you have you know preliminary motions or emergency arbitration, for example, that might involve a virtual proceeding. So you mentioned I, just I, I agree. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think they're here to stay to some degree. Again, like I said, I, I always prefer, I, I think for certain cases, an in-person hearing is always the, the, best, uh, the best method of conducting an arbitration, for example. Um, <clears throat> but, but it really did take something like COVID-19 to kind of, I think, force the industry's hand into uh, learning that these virtual hearings could be effective and positive. Uh, because I don't think anybody would have um, voluntarily done these virtual hearings, but, uh, but because our hands were forced over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think I agree with you. I think we've learned that for, for the, in the right cases, I think they can be effective and they can really drive down costs. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, this interview series that I'm doing now probably wouldn't have been possible or, or as easy as it is pre-pandemic because now everybody is familiar with using Zoom. Everyone, you know, has all of the audio and visual equipment to have a conversation like this. Right. Mm. right, right. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that, you know, some of your cases are complex and actually <laughs> last uh, several weeks. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a, a big range in, in the complexity and length of the proceedings that you're involved in. And in light of that, I wanted to ask you, how proactive are you in arbitral proceedings? Uh, what do you mean by proactive in this context? What I'm thinking about is, you know, how involved should users be um, in, in the in arbitral proceedings. Uh, so for example, you know, some in-house counsel want to be in, included in the uh, communications list from the tribunal. Instead of waiting for external counsel to forward them a message with a, a memo, the in-house counsel will get all of the inter-parties, uh, all, all of the communications with the tribunal straight away, whether it's just an email exchange or if it's a filing of submissions. You know, is, is that helpful? Uh, another element will be, you know, uh, uh, like what, what is your role or how do you see your role during the arbitration in terms of saying, okay, uh, let, like we've got, had the first round of submission, is this an appropriate time to think about settling or, or mediation? So yeah, that's what yeah. I mean by being proactive. Very good. Well, well uh, <clears throat> in that context, I would say I'm, I'm very proactive. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, as a, I've, I'm a litigation manager internally, but I'm a former litigator externally. Um, so, so what I consider my role to be is I manage I manage the process internally, meaning the communications, the strategy. Um, but in terms of externally, I consider myself uh, a member of the outside counsel team that that litigates a case. So I would say that I'm involved in virtually every aspect of a proceeding, whether it's um, reviewing and helping to draft pleadings, uh, uh, communications, um, <clears throat> strategy for um, oral arguments and that kind of thing and presentations, cross-examinations. Um, and the reason is uh, one, because I have a litigation background. So that's something that has, um, you know, I think allows me to be a, a, a vital member to the outside counsel team. But at the same time, there, there are certain strategies and certain um, ways that, you know, Chevron does things just like any client and certain expectations. And I think, you know, uh, being such a, um, I will say, a micromanager of my cases allows me to ensure that, you know, cases are run the right way in the way that Chevron expects them to be run. And uh, so I would say in terms of proactivity in my matters, on a scale from one to 10, I would say I'm probably a 12. Wow. <laughs> um and I, I think that that client involvement is really important. Uh, but before I ask you about you know, what young practitioners can do to understand the client a bit more, can you, uh, you know, do you consider a settlement in, in the course of arbitration proceedings? You know, is this sort of a step that you always consider as a matter of course, or is it you know just something you think about if if the particular case unfolds in a way that seems amenable to settlement? I know uh, I, I would say that. Um, personally, for my matters, and I and I can I think I can safely say this about um, matters that I my colleagues uh, manage as well. So we always think about settlement, mm -hmm. uh, it, particularly because sometimes our disputes are with you know with our business partners, and um, and that's not something that we want to do. Um, you know, we 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 treat uh, full blown arbitration as a as a last resort, and we're always trying to to find ways to resolve a case informally, whether it's through straight um, you know, settlement discussions, mediation, um, other types of ADR. Uh, we, we, we like to see cases resolved commercially if we can. So, so we're, all, we're thinking settlement at every point, um, start to finish in the course of a dispute. Um, and, and sometimes the things we're doing is it, to try to position a matter for, for settlements. Um, sometimes when you get into full-blown arbitration proceedings, which you know, even arbitration proceedings can last, you know, multiple years, um, it makes, it it's becomes a little more difficult to get the parties to come together and reach a commercial resolution, um, which is why I think you need to be a little proactive in trying to make that happen. And that's something I frequently try to do because I think that uh, um, if parties can reach a settlement and avoid uh, an arbitral award, uh, that's always a better uh, resolution and outcome. 
your emphasis on a commercial solution is a really important one. I think that also goes to your earlier point about how having the client involved and, and being informed of every step of a legal proceeding means that maybe we can you know, have a better strategy that, that better aligns with the client's objectives and the, and the counterparty's commercial objectives as well. So yeah. my question is, what is your advice for junior and mid-level practitioners and better understanding the client? And where I'm getting at here is I, I think, you know, younger practitioners might feel like, you know, the, the relationship with the client should belong to the senior associate or, or the partner or most of the formal client communications will go through them, even if the underlying email or the research is drafted by a more junior member of the team. <laughs> what, what's your advice for young practitioners to get to know the client better and really understand the business? That's, that's a great question um, because it, it wasn't that long ago that I <clears throat> was a young practitioner myself. Uh, so a part of me still likes to think of myself as a young practitioner. Um, but what one is, and I can say for the cases that I manage, I always request that the younger practitioners or the mid-level practitioners participate in conference calls or, or strategy sessions that we have. And I will say that, and, and I completely understand the dynamics of how law firms work um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the partners that are leading the charge. Um, but I will say that my, my, my number one piece of advice for young practitioners um, is two things, and they're kind of related to each other. One is get to know your client's business as best you can. I mean, that can be a, a challenge for complex businesses, but um, getting to know your client's business is something that um, allows you to give better advice and better identify the strategies the commercial strategies that your client's interested in. And secondly, I will say in any given uh, litigation matter, or arbitration matter for a young or mid-level practitioner, um, become the master of the facts of a particular dispute. And what that does is it makes, you, you get to make yourself indispensable because um, you know, the, the law is the law, but, but cases are won and lost on the facts. And um, when you become the master of the facts, you get you make yourself indispensable to a case. You make yourself indispensable to every single call. You make yourself indispensable to strategy sessions, and that's how young practitioners can really leave their mark. Um, I actually have a practice when we're having when I pose questions to external counsel um, during phone calls. I actually have a practice of of asking specific questions of the younger practitioners um, because they um, and and this is just you know common sense, they're the ones that know the facts. They're the ones that have been gathering the facts, the ones that have been digesting the facts um, and putting it all together. So um, I guess that would be my number one piece of advice for young practitioners and, and how to make yourself indispensable to a particular case team and how to, uh, and how to really um, make your mark, I would say. I think a lot of the young practitioners watching this video will be really heartened to hear that you, you really cherish and value their contribution and their views before this. Well, they, they probably feel I put them on the spot sometimes. So <laughs> they cherish it, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, before this interview, we talked about a, a, an ADR related anecdote that you frequently share with young practitioners. And I was wondering if you would be happy to share it here. Sure. Uh, and this is something and it's, it's ADR related. I mean, I heard it in ADR related context but I, uh, it, it really cuts across everything. And I, um, and it just is something that stuck with me my whole career. And it's something somebody told me when I was a young lawyer. And, it, and it, it, I, I didn't understand it at the time, but essentially what he said is, he said, you're never too young. You're, you're never too young to start being a lawyer. And the reason he said that is because a lot of times when we're doing our day job and we're, you know, we're doing document review or we're, you know, writing memos or we're doing legal research, we, we kind of, um, we, we start to look at certain issues with blinders on and we don't look at the bigger picture. And sometimes young practitioners have that, um, that's something that, you know, they, they do. And I think that, you know, thinking strategically every day about a particular case thinking globally about the best resolution, thinking about ways to position something for settlement. Um, young lawyers can do that just as well as older experienced lawyers. And you're never too young to start thinking about those things and to make your voice heard, whether internally to the partners you work with, um, 
ask those kind of questions or make those kind of points when you're dealing with the clients. You know, you're never too young to start thinking that way and to start being a lawyer. And that, that anecdote really stuck with me um, early on in my career. And that is such good advice to share. I have one more question for you, which is if you could do it again, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> Gosh, great question. Um, how long, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, uh, I would tell my younger self to, to don't hesitate to let your voice be heard. Um, you know, again, lawyers are paid for their, their, their thoughts and their internal analysis. And I think sometimes younger practitioners or even mid-level practitioners are hesitant to, to voice their opinion on certain matters. Um, one, because they feel that, oh, well, of course, my, my opinion is probably obvious because I'm working with a senior practitioner who is, you know, very knowledgeable. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, and I, I think that the reason we, as clients, hire diverse groups of, of counsel to represent us is because our expectation is that everyone's going to put their voices forward. Everyone's going to share their thoughts. That's what we're paying for. Um, and I, I would say that maybe when I was younger, I was a little hesitant to, to speak up when I, when I thought something um, uh, differently or, or, you know, when I could have played devil's advocate when I, uh, or I could have played devil's advocate instead I, you know, stayed quiet. And I would, so I would encourage my younger self to, to speak up more. And I would encourage young practitioners today, um, you know, speak up or let your voice be heard. Thank you so much for the invitation to really, you know, participate and to help build an open culture and to have the freedom and to exercise that freedom to speak up. Um, thank you again for your time, Aaron, and for sharing thank, your insights. Thank you, thank Lizzie. You I appreciate it. Thank you, Lizzie. It was a great time. Thank you again, Aaron.